Hello everyone, I am the Magic Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and the deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from Ikoria, Lair of Behemoths, Winota, Joiner of Forces. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. Other ways you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. Patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to that down in the description too. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Winota is a 4-4 human warrior for 2 generic, 1 red and 1 white. Although her triggered ability is combat dependent, making her seem like just another combat centric well right commander, she's actually quite different from those. Whenever a non-human creature you control attacks, you look at the top 6 cards of your library and cheat a human from those onto the battlefield. This is an insane ability especially considering that Winota is a 4-4 four, four for 4 mana. This means that you could very easily get out a non-human onto the battlefield before her and then that same turn cheat something useful onto the battlefield. With enough acceleration you can achieve this before turn 4. It might seem like the deck needs to juggle humans and non-humans in order to work, but it doesn't have to if you include humans that create non-human creature tokens when they enter the battlefield. That way you can set up the ideal situation for when Winota enters the battlefield as well as when she's chaining into her ability. This is why the deck contains PNLR, Gear of War Gear Crafter, Thopter Engineer, Sandstep Outcast, and Seller of Songbirds. Each of these humans cost 3 mana to cast and create a non-human creature token when they enter the battlefield. This means that when you can cast them before Winota and then the turn Winota enters the battlefield, you can attack with that token to trigger her that same turn. Besides being useful before Winota, if Winota cheats one of them with her ability later on, they enter creating the token in order to be used next combat. You can also cast Hordling Outburst before Winota since it's cheaper than she is and it creates 3 non-human tokens that can attack the next turn with Winota on the battlefield, thus thrice triggering her and potentially chaining into more humans that create non-human tokens. Some of those being Captain of the Watch, Geist Honored Monk, Knight Captain of Eos, Pia and Kirin Nalar, Lina Selfless Champion, and Evangel of Heliot. Neither of these can be hard cast before Winota, but if they enter the battlefield afterwards, they'll create tokens to take advantage of Winota's ability in the next combat step. Even if you have to hard cast them, it's fine because they'll still make relevant tokens when entering the battlefield. Some of these are capable of creating a ton of tokens like Lina and Evangel of Heliot, so even if you end up hard casting them, they're still worth it. However, Scroll Rack bypasses that altogether. Scroll Rack is ridiculously good in this deck since it can swap out the cards in your hand for those on top of your library, meaning you can draw cards and then top deck humans you have in your hand to then cheat them onto the battlefield with Winota, especially those high costed humans. Loyal Apprentice might not create a non-human creature token when it enters the battlefield, but it's cheaper than Winota and creates a hasty non-human token at the beginning of our combat phase with Winota out, so that token can attack to trigger her so it essentially functions similarly to the previously mentioned humans. Chandra Acolyte of Flame, Chandra Flame Caller, and Elspeth Sun's Champion are the final ways of creating multiple non-human tokens in a single turn. Both Chandras create two elementals with haste that can swing in that same turn in order to take advantage of Winota. Due to this, their other abilities really aren't used unless a dire circumstance calls for it. Elspeth creates three soldiers that don't have haste but can be used as chump blockers. If they survive until the next turn, then they are able to attack to trigger Winota. Elspeth's ultimate is definitely incredibly useful since it can pump our entire army while also giving them flying. This makes them hit even harder and be harder to block too. Earlier I mentioned that not all humans in the deck are token creators. That's because they have multiple uses whether as draw engines, removal effects, anthem effects, or hate bears. So let's see who they are. Mentor of the Meek is quite useful since almost all of the tokens created in the deck have a power of 1, so unless they're pumped you can pay 1 for each one to draw a card off of them. Unfortunately, Inspiring Commander is only available digitally in Arena and has yet to be printed on paper, so Mentor of the Meek is our only sustainable card draw engine for tokens in this way. That being said, Idol of Oblivion can draw us a card for free each turn we create a token. All we have to do is tap it. It definitely does a lot of work in this deck. Skull Clamp also helps turn those tokens into card advantage. We do have to lose the token in the process, but the best tokens for these are the elementals created by Chandra as well as any extra tokens we have. Either way, it should only be used when we're starting to run out of steam. Palace Jailer can also help draw cards by making us the Monarchy the turn it enters the battlefield. It also functions similarly to Fiend Hunter and Banisher Priest, which are also in the deck. Not only are these removal effects relatively cheap to hard cast in our turn, but they can be cheated onto the battlefield with Winota. So you can exile a potential blocker before the defending player even has a chance to assign them as a blocker since all of this happens in the attack step of your combat phase. 
Either way, the deck is running generous gift to deal with any problem on the board, as well as Vandal Blast and Winds of Abandon, which can really set opponents back when overloaded. We can't run Cyclonic Rift, but that doesn't mean we can't aggravate opponents by overloading other things. Speaking of aggravating opponents, the deck is running Magus of the Moon, Aether Sworn Canonist, and Thalia Heretic Cathar for its hate bears. The deck is aggro and seeks to win via brutally overtaking the table, but we can't allow the rest of the table to follow suit or gang up against us. Magus of the Moon pretty much neuters multicolored decks, especially if they don't want red. Aether Sworn Canonist can really put a damper on Storm decks since they're only able to cast a single non-artifact spell each turn. It doesn't hurt us though, since we know that cheese spells without casting them. Thalia helps out further by making sure any new blockers enter the battlefield tapped. Not only that, but opponents' non-basic lands also enter the battlefield tapped. Grand Abolisher is the final hate bear in the deck that's more for protecting us than anything else. It helps ensure that we can go off without a hitch during our turn since opponents won't be able to cast anything during our turn. That means no removal, control magic, cantrips, etc. Playing Wainoda without interruption is definitely a quick way to spell doom to the table. Mother of Runes also helps with protection, at least one creature at a time, primarily Winota. An amazing early game drop, Mother of Runes can also protect itself if need be, but once Winota hits the table, she's the main target of its ability. As far as pumping the table in order to maximize the damage, the deck's running Kongming, Sleeping Dragon, and Benelish Marshall as Anthem effects stabled onto a human. Cheating these onto the battlefield with Winota is great because our army is pumped during our attack step before even reaching the block step or damage step. We can also pump creatures with Cathar's Crusade. This enchantment is crazy here since it puts a plus one plus one counter on each of our creatures whenever a creature enters the battlefield. So if multiple creatures are being cheated onto the battlefield, our entire army gets pumped. It also does so when creature tokens enter the battlefield. I imagine you can already envision how insane it gets with this enchantment on the battlefield after we get our engines going. So it can definitely go a long way if there's a significant amount of tokens onto the battlefield. Same goes with Angrath's Marauders. The Marauders have a steep cost at 7 mana, but that's meaningless if cheated onto the battlefield with Winota. If you draw into it but don't want to hard cast it, you can try and top deck it in response with the previously mentioned scroll rack. Once on the battlefield, its effect is devastating since it doubles the amount of damage you deal to opponents and their permanents. Masako the Humorless is another amazing boon since she allows our tapped creatures to block. This means that we can still chump block with our tokens even though they're tapped or the humans entering the battlefield tapped due to Winota putting them onto the battlefield that way. It's evident that the main route to victory with this deck is combat, which is a bit jaded for a red-white commander at this point. That being said, Winota is potentially the best one so far at combat tricks since she's very cheap for what she does and incredibly efficient. Since combat hijinxes are her bread and butter, let's not be coy about it and actually do something more with it. Aggravated Assault can be very backbreaking in this deck even if we get just one more combat phase. If we attack with 3 non-human tokens and triggered Winota enough to get maybe 3 more non-human tokens onto the battlefield, next combat will be able to trigger Winota 6 more times. That's crazy effective with a simple start. Sure, it costs 5 mana each time to activate, but we can do double duty with our creatures thanks to Phyrexian Altar and Ashnet's Altar. We can sacrifice those humans that already did their part by creating non-human creature tokens in order to generate the mana needed to activate Aggravated Assault and continue attacking with even more non-human creatures. This gets out of hand very quickly. If that weren't enough, we can get infinite combat phases with Goto Bandit Warlord and Helm of the Host. Usually Goto is expensive to cast, but Winota is able to cheat him onto the battlefield. Then he'll tutor for Helm of the Host and then cheat that onto the battlefield. If both are able to survive until your next turn, you can equip the Helm to him and game over. Let's quickly see how this works. With Goto equipped with the Helm, at the beginning of combat, the Helm creates a non-legendary copy of Goto. You can then fetch for another equipment if you like as a bonus, which is great, but let's not lose track of the infinite combo. This token gains haste, so you can attack with the Goto copy. That triggers his extra combat ability. This has the Helm create another non-legendary copy of Goto in that new combat phase. You can thus create infinitely many non-legendary copies of Goto and kill off the table for the win. That's not the only epic win either. We can take even more advantage of all of these creatures when Noda has entering the battlefield with Perforous God of the Forge. Even though we're usually concentrating on one opponent at a time with our horde until we kill them off, with Perforos on the battlefield we might as well be able to take out the entire table. Not only that, but Perforos is an amazing mana sink since you can pump all your creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. He's also a god, meaning that if you meet Devotion and are able to attack with him, he'll also trigger Winota. Alright, the main win cons of the deck are creature dependent, so that means we need ways of protection for our board state from opponents who might want to wipe the board. Not a problem, the deck is running Rootborn Defenses, Flawless Maneuver, and Make a Stand. Each of these instants costs 3 to cast, but Flawless Maneuver can be cast for free if we control Winota. As a bonus, Rootborn Defenses populates, which is great at creating another non-human token we have on the battlefield. 
Boros Charm can also be used to give our permanents indestructible in case we want to protect our other permanents as well from a planner cleansing type board wipe. If we're close to winning the game, we can also give a beefy creature double strike if it means killing off our final opponent. Eerie Interlude is another way to protect our creatures and possibly even better than the previously mentioned for instance. Eerie Interlude is a delayed blink effect meaning that we exile our creatures but they return at the beginning of the next end step. This means that we can protect our creatures from an overloaded cyclonic rift or other mass bounce effect, a mass negative toughness effect like toxic deluge, or a mass sacrifice effect like all is dust. We can also choose which creatures are exiled too which can be quite productive if we want to use it offensively by blinking our token creating creatures before our next turn in order to have even more non-human creature tokens without losing the tokens we already have. So this is possibly one of my favorite cards of the deck. Selfless Spirit and Luminous Broodmoth are the two creature based protection effects in the deck. Just like Lena, which was mentioned earlier in the video, we can sacrifice Selfless Spirit in order to make our creatures indestructible until end of turn. With Luminous Broodmoth, our non-flying creatures will return after a board wipe with a flying counter on them, so it helps deter opponents into casting that wrath as well, since we'll be the only ones with creatures afterwards. Another great thing about Luminous Broodmoth is that if we sacrifice token creators to our altars for mana, they'll return to the battlefield and create more non-human creature tokens as well as getting mana from it. Oh, and they'll have flying too so the Moth is definitely a great engine piece in the deck. As a bonus, these creatures aren't human, so they trigger Winota when they attack. In order to provide fast protection for Winota, the deck is also running Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots. These can help protect other key creatures as well, but they're cheaper than Winota, so if you're able to cast either of them before her, they can help her stick around more after casting her. And if we were to lose something, Misfilled Planes can help recover it. Even though we're bottom decking something from the graveyard, the deck has plenty of fetch lands, so we have ways of shuffling the deck. In fact, the deck's running Mad Blind Mountain for this very reason. This also helps in getting some things bottom decked by Winota's ability. So not only do the fetches help fix mana, they can also fetch for Misfail Plains and Mad Blind Mountain, which synergize super well here. And as lands that tap for colored mana, they don't take up slots in the deck. Even though Winota cheats humans onto the battlefield, we still need to actually cast our other spells as well as trying to get an early game advantage with Winota. Therefore, the deck needs all the help it can get in this department, which is the same way we'd usually go with a red-white deck, since Cartographer's Hawk and Verge Rangers are insultingly slow, especially since we were promised mono-white mana solutions in Commander 2020, but I digress. The fact remains that I am not running them in the deck. I am running Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, Chrome Mox, and Mox Opal as the early game mana rocks to try and get Winota out by turn 3 while also being able to trigger her. Since we have to mainly rely on mana rocks, the deck's also running Arcane Signet, Boro Signet, Talisman of Conviction, and Felwar Stone to round out the suite of mana rocks in the deck. At least these can still provide a turn 3 Winota, so they're good enough in the deck. Smothering Tithe can also provide us even more mana rocks since we get a treasure token whenever an opponent draws a card. It's amazing how often this can create a token since opponents don't want to slow down their turns just to deny us a treasure. Dockside Extortionist can also create treasure tokens, but it's only when it enters the battlefield, but it depends on how many artifacts our opponents control. However, since it's a non-human, we can also attack with it in order to trigger Winota, which is definitely a plus. Similarly, we can swing in with Burnished Heart and Solemn Simulacrum to trigger Winota, so even though they're mainly used to ramp basic lands onto the battlefield, we can also use them for further value in this deck, much more so than a card like Cartographer's Hawk. What a disappointment. The rest of the deck is just the lands. The deck's running all 8 fetch lands, Plateau, Sacred Foundry, Battlefield Forge, Cliff Top Retreat, Some Big Canyon, Command Tower, Mana Confluence, City of Brass, Reflecting Pool, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 8 of each snow basic land in case opponents are running anything that benefits us for it. If you don't already have a plateau, then swap it out for Exotic Orchard if you're on a budget, as well as swapping out the enemy fetches for more basic lands. This significantly reduces the cost of the deck, especially since we're probably never getting any meaningful reprints of fetch lands. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Winota Joiner of Forces. This deck is just insane. Winota is incredibly powerful and you can take over the game very quickly when left unchecked. Since no one knows what you're going to cheat onto the battlefield, you might win the game out of nowhere given the right pieces. As far as red-white commanders go, I consider Winota to be a home run along the same vein as Feather the Redeemed. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Method Kirby, and happy brewing!